Good evening and welcome to you from Rasha Christie, South Africa. For those of you who don't know who Rasha Christie is, we are a student campus organization. It's an organization which began in the United States. And we also now have chapters around uh, the globe. Um, but yes, we are a student campus organization that exists to serve uh, Christian students and professors on campuses to help them better understand the reasons for uh, and the truth of the Christian worldview, uh, be they philosophical, historical, or scientific uh, reasons and arguments we would make um, uh, for the Christian faith. And the purpose of that is to strengthen uh, the convictions of those who proclaim uh, Christ, but also to improve the conversation between those who do not share uh, the Christian worldview so that we can communicate the gospel in a much more compelling and persuasive manner. But we do have uh, Dr. Uh, Craig with us this evening, and it is a tremendous privilege. But um, we're going to have some Q&A now with Dr. Craig. And so um, we've got a number of questions that have rolled in from um, uh, our uh, audience online. I'm going to read these out to Dr. Craig, and, and then he's going to tackle them. But first of all, let's say good evening to Dr. Craig. How are you? I am well. Thank you very much, Simon. I wish I could be there in person in South Africa, but it's wonderful to be able to join you on this remote call. Excellent. We, we do owe you a trip to the Kruger National Park, and hopefully that will happen sometime in the future. All oh, right, let's, yeah. dive into our, let's dive into our first question then. Our first question is, if God created space-time, he is outside of it and not subject to it and change. How would you then describe his interaction with time? If he enters in and he is not then sub he is then not subject to change. Perhaps surprisingly for the questioner, I don't believe that space-time exists. Uh, I think that space-time is just a heuristic device. That is to say, it is simply a geometrical four-dimensional way of representing what in reality are separate entities, namely space and time. So I think that since the moment of creation, God is in time uh, and does undergo non-essential changes, like knowing what time it is or knowing what he is now causing in the universe. But I'm not inclined to think that God is in space. I, I'm inclined to think that God transcends space, even though he does exist in time. Okay. All right. Uh, to our next question then, uh, would Dr. Craig agree that B theory fails to distinguish being from becoming, since extension is merely a case of being? What time talk is supposed to be about God to be about becoming? For those who lack the background of the questioner, he's referring to a theory of time according to which the difference between past, present, and future is just a subjective illusion of human consciousness. In fact, all events in time, whether past, present, or future, to us are equally real and existent, and therefore temporal becoming is not an objective feature of the world. It's simply a subjective feature of human consciousness. I think at the end of the day that the questioner is correct that what these proponents of the so-called B theory of time or tenseless theories of time um, is talking about is not time. Although they posit relations of earlier than and later than between events, I think they evacuate those relations of all temporal significance because they cannot explicate them in terms of more fundamental uh, um, properties of past, present, or future. Um, instead, the relations they posit between events are more like the relations greater than and lesser than that hold between numbers in the series of natural numbers. Three is less than five, five is greater than three. And similarly, their relations of earlier than and greater than are just, um, I think, atemporal relations that are only gratuitously called 
temporal. So I do agree at the end of the day with the questioner that, that this entity that is discussed by B theorists of time is not really time. Okay. Um, this next question, um, is the coming into being of new souls an example of, of God creating ex nihilo? I didn't quite catch it. The coming into being of what? New souls. New souls. I'm still not understanding. You, Saul. New, new as in new souls. A new soul. S-O-U-L. New souls. Is the coming into being of new souls uh, an example of God creating <laughs> ex nihilo? Okay, I'm afraid I just don't understand the question, Simon. Um, okay. So well, I, I can't answer that. All right, fine. Well, we'll move on then. Neither do I. So um, I'm <laughs> going to push on to the next question. Then. When agnostic and cosmologist uh, Alexander Vilenkin says that all evidence in the, in the science community points that the universe had a beginning, which evidence is he talking about? Well, he's talking primarily about the evidence for the expansion of the universe, which would be based on things like the red shift in the light from distant galaxies, the abundance of the light elements that were created in the first um, fraction of a second of the Big Bang, like deuterium and hydrogen, and then the uniformity of the microwave background radiation in the early universe, plus his own theorem, the bohr guth vilenkin theorem, which shows that um, the past cannot be extended uh, indefinitely into the past, but much reach a boundary at some point. You can try to evade the bohr guth vilenkin theorem by denying its fundamental general condition, but then what Vilenkin will do is appeal to other evidence, for example, that these so-called cyclical universes will run into problems in um, getting involved in very messy conditions uh, at the moment of the rebound to a new universe that would prevent them either from rebounding or would prevent us from seeing the homogeneity of the universe. So it's it's a whole range of evidence that conspires to establish the conclusion with a good degree of probability that the universe is not past eternal. Okay. And by the way, if readers are interested, Vilenkin has a very nice popular book uh, on cosmology uh, for the curious, I think is the title, uh, and is a beginner's book. And he lays all of this out in that book. Okay. Excellent, excellent. I would commend uh, that to the uh, the viewers to go and look at that resource. Okay, the next question has uh, I think more to do with uh, theology uh, in terms of uh, as opposed to science. Uh, Dr. Craig, if God has created space time, He is outside of it and is not subject to it and change. How would you then describe His interaction with time? If He mm -hmm. enters in, is He then not subject to change? Well, that's very similar to the earlier question where I said, I don't think that space-time exists. Uh, space-time is just um, a diagrammatic device for representing space and time together on a single um, chart, as it were. You could do the same thing with temperature and pressure. You could have a chart where one axis is the pressure, and as the pressure increases on the other axis, the temperature goes up. But there isn't any such thing as temperature pressure. Um, similarly, I don't think there's any such thing as space time. And so I think that God is, in fact, in time since the beginning of the universe, and that he does undergo these trivial changes, like knowing what time it is. When the Bible talks about God's immutability or changelessness, it's talking about the fundamental fixity of God's moral character and promises, and certainly those are unchanging. Um, but he can change in the respect that he knows what time it is right now or what's happening right now throughout the universe. Okay. Um... Uh, some more questions rolling in here. 
Um, this is, uh, I think there's two questions related here. The first one is two, two prominent uh, no beginning models are the Hawking Hartle no boundary universe and Roger Penrose conformal cyclic cosmology. What are, on your, what are your thoughts about them? Well, with respect to the Hartle Hawking model, that actually is a model that involves a beginning. This is very evident uh, in um, Hawking's uh, recent book with Leonard Mladenov, where they characterize the initial point uh, of space-time as the beginning of the universe. What the model does not involve is a singularity. It, the, the point at which the universe begins is just like any other point in space-time, and therefore the laws of physics don't break down. They can be traced all the way back to the beginning. So the, the model does involve a beginning. It just doesn't involve a singularity. Now, as for the Penrose model, um, a very eminent cosmologist whose name I shall not reveal recently said to me that Penrose's model really isn't taken seriously in the contemporary cosmological community. And the reason is because it's based on an alien physics. It, it doesn't work according to the known laws of physics. And so Penrose has to invent a sort of alien physics uh, to make the model work. And until the model can be made consistent with the laws of physics, there's little chance that it's really going to be taken seriously as a realistic option for the universe rather than just an interesting mathematical model. Okay. And since we are talking about uh, your response to Roger Penrose's um, model, uh, I did take the time to listen to uh, your interview with uh, Roger Penrose on the Justin Briley show, uh, Unbelievable. Yes. Um, I, I would like for you maybe to take a few minutes for us and un unpack some of that exchange there, because I was itching to ask you some questions. Oh, uh, one of which is I would love for you, maybe if you can just share that in that interaction with Roger, but maybe explain to those who don't know who Roger Penrose is and why he is so significant. But um, if maybe you can unpack that for, for us a bit, that exchange and share your thoughts. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you at a moment in the interview, you kind of bring him to the conclusion of what the first cause might be. And then he yep. says to you, well, what must I do with that? Right. And of course, I wanted to say, well, you need to worship that if that's what it is. <laughs> um, but, but maybe you can unpack a bit of that exchange because I thought it was very rich. And, and I can also direct uh, the people who are listening in this evening to go to Unbelievable channel on YouTube right. and go and listen to that rich exchange. But maybe you could share a bit about that uh, discussion. Certainly. To dialogue about these issues with Sir Roger Penrose, one of the greatest physicists of all time, was beyond my wildest dreams. And Penrose is a scientist who has a strong philosophical streak. He asks deep philosophical questions about science. And he says that there are three mysteries about the universe that he cannot solve. He says, on the one hand, there is the physical realm that we're all familiar with, the realm studied by physics. But then in addition to that, there is the realm of mathematics, this realm of abstract objects like numbers and sets and functions and other mathematical entities. And these are not physical realities. These are abstract entities completely divorced from the physical world, even though, uncannily, the physical world operates according to mathematical laws uh, that embody these abstract mathematical equations. Then there is the third realm, which is the realm of the mind. Penrose is not a physicalist, about the mind. He believes that the mind or the realm of the mental of thought is distinct from the physical, but it's obviously not abstract and mathematical. Uh, our minds are mentally active in grasping the mathematical realm and the physical realm. And so the mystery for Penrose is how do these three 
disparate realms of reality come together in a harmonious unity. And what I shared with him was that theism provides the key to unlock that puzzle. On theism, ultimate reality is an infinite mind. As you say, Simon, God himself, an infinite unembodied mind whose thoughts are captured by the mathematical realm, studied by mathematicians. And God has created the universe, the physical world, on the pattern of a mathematical blueprint that he had in mind. So on theism, these three seemingly disparate realms of reality come together in a beautiful unity where you have an infinite mind whose thoughts are the abstract conceptual realm and who creates the physical realm on the model of these abstract entities and equations. And as you say, Penrose's response to this was not to disagree, but to just say, well, I, I don't know what to do with that. And my thought and response to that was, well, you have been asking metaphysical questions. Mm -hmm. And this is a metaphysical response. It doesn't matter if it doesn't have any scientific cash value for you to do something with, because you're not asking a scientific question. You're posing a deep metaphysical question, and theism provides a satisfactory metaphysical answer to that question. So that was, I think, the most important um, feature of our very congenial and interesting dialogue. And afterward, off the air, uh, Sir Roger thanked me personally for sharing this alternative with him. He said, I, I just never thought of that before. Yes, I, I also thought it was a tremendous conversation because um, it really opened up those questions. And of course, in studying church history and the, the varieties of arguments for the existence of God, of course, they're, they're all then begin to line up and queue up, queue up with a cumulative case, you know? Yes. So um, I was just hoping that you could have had more time to just push that even further. But um, <laughs> Well, I, I didn't want to be too heavy handed yes. about evangelizing <laughs> Sir Roger. And so you notice that I didn't, identify this infinite mind as God, I thought that would be obvious for anybody to be able to read between the lines. But you're exactly right. I mean, what I was saying is the same sort of thing that great theists like Augustine and Aquinas said uh, long ago. Yes, no, terrific. So uh, that was wonderful. Maybe, maybe you will be able to do a uh, session two on 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 with Roger Penrose on those metaphysical questions. That would be fascinating to hear that. All right, let's let's go to some more questions here now. Um, there was a second question to that that first one before we had our little uh, rabbit trail there on on Dr. Mm -hmm. Roger Penrose. But uh, does the beginning of the universe necessarily imply an intelligent creator? Are there other possible hypotheses to explain a physical universe with a beginning? When we do natural theology, we're not looking to eliminate all possibilities. Possibilities come cheap. What we're looking for are the most plausible or best explanations. And I argue that the best explanation of the origin of an effect with a beginning from an eternal cause is that that cause is a personal intelligent agent. And in my uh, published work, like Reasonable Faith, I give three arguments in support of that conclusion. The first one would be the one I just said, that only a free agent can explain how a temporal effect with the beginning can originate from an eternal and permanent cause. The second argument is that this cause has already been shown to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. And I can think of only two candidates that would fit that description. One would be an abstract object, like a number. The other would be an unembodied mind. But as Sir Roger uh, indicated in our conversation, an abstract object can't cause anything. They are causally a feat. 
And so that implies that the cause of the universe is plausibly an unembodied mind. And then the third argument is the one given by Richard Swinburne uh, of Oxford University. Swinburne points out that there are two kinds of causal explanations, uh, scientific explanations in terms of laws of nature and initial conditions, and then personal explanations in terms of an agent and his volitions. And as Swinburne argues, a first state of the universe cannot be explained in terms of laws of nature and initial conditions because there aren't any prior initial conditions. And therefore, an absolutely first state of the universe can only be explained by means of a personal explanation in terms of an agent and his volitions. And I think those are three very powerful uh, mutually reinforcing arguments for thinking that the cause of the origin of the universe is a personal free agent. Excellent. Excellent. I, I wanted to just, since, we, since the word intelligent creator is there, and I've never had a chance to ask you this in, in the time that we've got to talk, but um, I know um, you've made a lot of these arguments and the cosmological arguments and these kinds of arguments mm -hmm. and but I, I'm just interested to know what you make of uh, the contemporary design arguments that are around today. Um, and maybe that in light of, for example, things like um, the concession of uh, Francis uh, Crick to something like directed panspermia, which is to kind of oh. see this design and then go, well, there's, yeah. there's an because when he, when he, when he, when he puts that out as a possible um, option, it, it kind of, in my estimation, maybe I'm wrong, is a concession to granting that there is at least an intelligence there, but then of course you're stuck with either it being a divine intelligence yeah. or some 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 other aliens, and then that just kind of kicks the can down the road. So I've never had a chance to ask you about what you think of the design arguments, uh -huh. uh, but maybe if you could comment on those for me. That would be I would love to hear yes. your views on the design arguments. Well, the hypothesis of panspermia that you referred to would be the notion that intelligent life or perhaps a creator has seeded the earth with um, intelligent life, that it came from elsewhere in the cosmos. Intelligent life did not originate on this planet, but it came from somewhere else. Now, this type of objection, Simon, is directed against design arguments based upon life on earth. And I think that the cutting edge discussion of design arguments today is much broader. It's based upon the fine tuning of the entire universe for intelligent embodied life. And their panspermia won't go any distance to explaining how these initial conditions of the universe could be fine tuned for um, embodied intelligent life any place in the cosmos, not just on Earth, any place. And so I think the contemporary argument from the fine tuning of the Big Bang for embodied intelligent agents is extremely powerful. The response of skeptics to this form of the argument is typically to posit some sort of multiverse hypothesis where you have an infinite array of universes whose fundamental constants and quantities are randomly ordered so that somewhere in the ensemble, by chance alone, um, intelligent embodied agents would appear. Uh, and lucky us, we're living in one of those worlds. And in my published work, I've shared, in fact, what is Sir Roger Penrose's, I think, devastating criticism of using this multiverse hypothesis to try to explain away the fine tuning of the universe. So I do think that this argument is, is very powerful um, and does suggest that the universe is the product of a transcendent designer who has established the laws of nature and set the constants and quantities in such a way as to permit the evolution and existence of intelligent life in the cosmos. 
Okay. And what would be your understanding in terms of the fine tuning arguments and their relationship uh, to some of the teleological arguments in terms, in terms of like, you know, the arguments being made from semiotic structures, information systems, and biological structures. Yeah. And what is, what is your, your view on the relationship between those kinds of arguments? There? What I would say is that the fine tuning argument shows that it is incomprehensibly improbable that these finely tuned initial conditions of the universe could have arisen by chance alone. And these other arguments that you mentioned about the evolution of biological complexity on Earth simply layer on more improbability, just improbability upon improbability, so that the chance hypothesis becomes even more untenable. So they're in, in a word, they're complementary to okay. each other. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting because I've often I of the arguments that I enjoy, I really appreciate um, some of the design arguments that are being made, um, particularly by people from the Discovery Institute, many of those yes. scholars um, that I've enjoyed some of that, that that's been quite helpful. Um, uh, I don't know, I wanted to ask you, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, did you ever get a chance to read Thomas Nagel's book? Um, uh, when he, when that came out a few years ago, um, it, where he, I know he's a very famous atheist and, mm -hmm. um, philosopher. I actually, when the book came, came out, I was actually, I got in touch with him and I wrote oh. him an email and asked him if he would be interested in doing a dialogue between himself and Alvin Plantinga, because oh. I thought a conversation between him and Alvin Plantinga would have been fascinating. So I, this was when I was in the U.S. I was trying very hard to organize it, but he he declined. And and as I understand, it was because he um, he has a hear bad hearing uh, problem as well. So oh. so so he he was struggling with that. So yes. but anyway, I was because I thought that would be a conversation. But did you read Thomas Nagel's book? And what did you make of his his concessions towards the um, some of the discovery scholars like Stephen Meyer and and Michael B. and yeah. also. Also, his concession to the notion of 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 morality and and being in the yes. universe. Yeah. So uh, I'd be interested to see what you thought of Thomas Nagel's work. Yes, I, I did read that, and it's remarkably candid. Where he says, uh, "It's not that um, theism lacks prominent defenders." He says, "Some of the most intelligent philosophers that I know today are theists." He says, "It's that I just don't want God to exist. I don't want to live." in a universe like that. So he's very candid about that. But his explanation of mind in the universe, which was, remember, again, one of those three areas that I talked to Sir Roger about, the mind, the mental, he's also not a physicalist. He doesn't think that you can reduce the mind to the brain or just brain states. But as I recall, it's been some years since I've read it. He's a kind of panpsychist, I believe. Um, and I think that's just a desperate alternative. I, I think it's far more plausible to think that there is a transcendent mind that has created the universe than to think that somehow matter is inherently imbued with mind or consciousness. So uh, I, I think, again, it just sh shows the desperation out there um, among thoughtful philosophers who want to resist theism. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, another question here. Uh, Dr. Craig, thank you for all your hard work and for showing us how to love the Lord with your entire heart, soul, and mind. What advice would you give to young Christians going into the academy? Oh, my, there's so much one could say. Um, I would say, first of all, really lay a good foundation in high school before you even go off to university. Uh, and then I would say at the university, I would recommend following some sort of liberal arts curriculum where you will study a wide variety of the disciplines on the undergraduate level so that you will become a well-rounded, well-educated person. So you'll take some literature, some math, uh, some science, some history, some uh, international relations, some art criticism, some music history, and so forth, and become a well-rounded and well-educated person. And I would say you should also lay in 
a good knowledge of basic intro to logic. Um, if you will simply master the basic nine rules of logic, this will help you no matter what area you go into, because all reasoning is conducted according to these basic nine rules of logic. And if you have them down, this will enable you both to spot fallacies in the objections of your opponents, but then also to formulate your own arguments in a valid way. So a basic knowledge of logic, I think, would be important. And I'm also a fan of learning foreign languages. I, I think that if you can master a foreign language, that that will open up uh, an additional set of literature to you. And this would be especially important, for example, if any of our listeners aspire to a career in theology. If you're going to do theology, then you're going to need to get New Testament Greek at least you're probably you're going to need German, um, and so get some some knowledge of foreign languages as well as English. So those would be some suggestions for the beginner. Okay, excellent. Um, here's another question for you: How does one persuade anti-intellectual Christians who say that there is no need to find answers? They don't have uh, questions about um, that. They don't have questions about. And when would you say one reaches a point of being overtly anti, overtly intellectual? Okay, so that's kind now, of we're we're talking here about Christians who claim that's to correct. have no need to ask these kinds of questions. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. What do you well? How do you, I guess I would say two things. That's fine for them right now if they don't feel the need to ask these questions, but it may well come along that say suddenly they or their child contracts leukemia or is killed in a pointless automobile accident. And then these kinds of questions will attack you with terrible severity. And if you are not prepared by having studied in advance these questions, you will likely be caught flat-footed and your faith may well founder. Um, when you go through these sorts of crises. So the best insulation against that is to be thinking about these deep questions before you encounter the crisis situation. The second thing, though, that I would say is that even if they don't feel any need to ask these questions, their kids will. Their children in high school and university are going to be bombarded by Secularism conjoined with every manner of relativism. And unless they prepare their children to answer these tough questions and to give positive reasons for believing in God and his self-revelation in Jesus, we're going to lose our kids. Uh, they're going to walk away from the faith and, and become secularist, and that will break the heart of any Christian parent. So for that reason, I don't think we can afford to be apathetic about these issues. Okay, and I've encouraged a lot of young people to read J.P. Morland's book, Love God With All Your Mind. I think there's mm -hmm. if no finer treatise on, on just convincing Christians about the life of the mind. It's a terrific work for all of you listening this evening, yes. I um, agree. Yes. Um, another question, are we switching over now to some, some, some more philosophical stuff? If there are no universals, in brackets, nominalism, then how is the first premise of the Kalam true? How can the mind come to know a universal truth about things if these things don't have natures that are real? You don't have to have universals in order to recognize that everything that begins to exist has a cause. It's true that that statement is universal in its scope. It's what logicians call universally quantified. Uh, logically, it states for all X, if X begins to exist, then X has a cause. But that's not about universals in the sense that nominalism debates. Universals in that sense are properties um, that are exemplified by particular things. And so he mustn't confuse being universal 
in quantificational logic with the metaphysical question of whether or not universals exist. And I maintain that we can maintain uh, or assert, rather, the truth of various sentences and um, even the fact that uh, certain things are essentially in certain ways without postulating these abstract, platonic, weird objects beyond space and time. I don't think positing those kind of weird objects does anything at all to uh, explain why things are the way they are. Okay. Uh, Dr. Craig, how would you respond to the objection that the non-deterministic character of quantum physics, quantum systems, is incompatible with, uh -huh. with the principle of causality? I would say that there's nothing in the Kalam cosmological argument that requires that every event have a cause. Uh, it is perfectly consistent with allowing that there can be uncaused events. Rather, it's talking about things and says that things don't come into being without a cause. And even in quantum physics, things that come into being through indeterminate processes still have causes. I remember talking with a quantum physicist at Purdue University, who said, what do people mean when they say these quantum uh, products are uncaused? She says, I can, I can give you the chain of causes that lead right up to the quantum effect. But secondly, and more importantly, the mathematical equations of quantum mechanics are susceptible to at least 10 different physical interpretations. And some of those interpretations are as fully deterministic as Newtonian mechanics. So it is simply not true that the success of quantum mechanics commits you to causal indeterminism of any sort. Uh, there are fully deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics that are uh, mathematically consistent and empirically equivalent to indeterministic uh, interpretations. And so this is not a counterexample to the claim that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Okay. We've got another question here, which kind of is hovering around the question of nominalism. It's back at Plato here again. So we're dodging as these questions are rolling in. How would you answer the objection that Plato theorized eternal forms of something's metaphysics? such as the truest form of a pen that exists eternally in one's mind that enables you to differentiate between other pens, especially when everything has a cause. Universals don't help you to differentiate between different objects because these different objects all share the same universal. If you have, for example, two pens, they both share the universal property of being a pen, what would differentiate them, at least in Aristotle's view, would be that they have different quantities of matter in them. Uh, one portion of matter instantiates one uh, universal, and then another portion of matter instantiates another universal. So universals don't do anything to differentiate things that are alike from each other, that would be something like the matter or the location in space and time or something else. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, uh, how do we get persons to value truth who simply don't? With the culture we see growing today, diverting away from scientific, uh, the scientific and biological and logical reasoning, uh, simply not valuing truth. I mean, we've seen this, for example, mm -hmm. in, the, in the development of uh, the social justice movement and critical theory where, mm -hmm. you know, science and maths and, and reasoning itself has been accused of being an instrument of oppression. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you communicate with that generation of yeah. people? Well, my best effort to do that, Simon, is through my explication of what I call the absurdity of life without God. I try to show that if God does not exist, then there is no ultimate meaning, value, or purpose 
to human life. And in particular, you could not say that there is anything wrong with racial discrimination, homophobia, persecution, uh, and so forth, which the critical race theorist and social justice theorist wants to affirm. So that his position becomes self-defeating and untenable. And in fact, the second part of my claim is that no one can live consistently and happily with mm -hmm. such a worldview. Uh, if you try to live consistently, you will be profoundly unhappy. You will be in despair, existential despair. Uh, and if you manage to live happily, it will only be by giving the lie to your worldview, by affirming the values, for example, of social justice, despite your denial of the objectivity of moral values. So I think that the person who tries to deny um, the existence of God and yet maintain objective meaning, value, and purpose in life is deeply, deeply conflicted. And yeah. my hope is that by sharing this, it will arouse the person to think about these questions. That What I just said doesn't in any way prove that God exists, but it does show that it makes a tremendous difference if God exists, and that therefore we cannot afford to be apathetic or indifferent to these fundamental questions. Excellent. I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Craig, do you have a lecture on that topic that you've done, like the ones that you sent to me? I've got to pick from four options from your lecture series there. But do you, have you done a lecture on that as well? Where you've Yes, we have a number of things on that. We have an animated video on it called Is okay. There Meaning in Life? It's on the web page, reasonablefaith.org, right on the homepage. And then we also have a short film on is there meaning in life? Um, and I believe, yes, there is also a talk on YouTube on the absurdity of life without God um, that I've sometimes given at various universities. So, yes, this is available for visual um, um, uh, viewing, as well as available in writing in, for example, my books on guard or reasonable faith. Okay, excellent. I'm just commend all of the audience to, to check out those resources. Uh, Dr. Craig, we are, we are slowly coming towards the end of our, our time slot here. And of course, I should like to uh, pepper you with so many more questions. But um, Oh, I can't believe it's gone by so quickly. Yes. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate uh, the time that you've given us uh, for this. Um, and uh, we... Um, uh, just terrific to, to, to catch up with you again. It's been quite some time since we uh, were in touch, but um, just want to say uh, thank you so much for giving us uh, about an hour of your time for a Q and a, uh, and thank you for all the work that you do and the books you write and the young people that you inspire. And um, we, we do want to, I'm going to ask on behalf of the Christian community here in South Africa, I'll just take the liberty of doing that, that we would very much like to see you, visit us, but even more your wife, Jan, whom we got to oh. see as well. She, she was a, a tremendous, um, uh, when she was over here, we had such fun and uh, I really appreciated her as well. And um, we would love for you guys to come back to South Africa. So maybe when this COVID thing passes and there's an, an, an opportunity, if you do have uh, some time open, we would very much love for you to come and uh, speak here in South Africa with the establishment of Rasha Christie. We've got a much uh, broader network of system now than we've had in the past. And so we should like to get you onto some campuses and into some churches. And then you can come and encourage the saints and teach us how to think and uh, encourage us to share the gospel. So maybe as I close up, maybe you can share a word with everybody who's listening in this evening, a word of encouragement to all the, the young Christians yeah. and people out there listening in. Well well, thank you so much, Simon, for the invitation, and I really do hope that uh, I can do that. I want to encourage uh, folks who are listening today to realize that we are living at a monumental time in world history. Over the last half century or so, there has been literally a revolution in Anglo-American 
philosophy, so that today Christian philosophy has a respected place at the table once again. And some of our finest philosophers at our most prestigious universities are outspoken Christians. Moreover, modern physics is more open to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe than it has been at any time in recent memory. And in New Testament studies as well, there has been a revolution with respect to the reliability of the Gospels and the credibility of the historical Jesus, so that today the Gospels are widely regarded as credible sources for the life and teaching of the historical Jesus. And so we as Christians are very well positioned today to win back places of influence at our cultural institutions, including our universities. And so I want to say to you there, do not be discouraged by the secular society around you that can seem so pressing. Look at the big picture. And when you do, I think you can see that we are living at a time that is uh, ripe for the expansion of the Christian gospel around the world. Well, thank you very much for those encouraging words, uh, Dr. Craig, and lots of love from the braces to Jan. And uh, thank, thank you, you once again for all that you do for us. God bless, and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. 